Okay, water is life. Life is water, we drink it. It nourishes our children, our food, and ourselves. We all stand on the same shore. We all draw water from the same well. We all live downstream, and we're all raising Elijah. And ladies and gentlemen, please everyone, give a very, very, very warm welcome to one of the uh, great voices of our age and our time, uh, Dr. Sandra Steingraber. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's an incredible honor to be here. Uh, Chris told me yesterday that music brings people together and opens their heart. And he went on to say that he's actually seen music turn sworn enemies in, into dance partners. Uh, I'm not a musician. I'm not even close. Uh, after 10 long years of uh, piano lessons, um, I wish I were. I actually, when I went off to college after those 10 years of piano lessons, I was trying to choose between music and biology. And I began taking music lessons, and when I walked at Illinois Wesleyan, which has uh, a, a kind of state-of-the-art music school, and as I walked down this long line of practice rooms and I heard the music coming out of the other rooms, I knew I, I could never do that. Right? So I went into the biology lab, and so became the girl that if you, if you knew a rat who needed a, a tracheotomy, I, you, ask, you come, come and ask me, right? That's good at animal surgery. So instead of tunes, I have uh, data to share with you. Can data bring people together and make them dance? Well, scientists like to think so, but I'm not sure that that's an evidence-based belief. Nevertheless, inspired by all the musicians gathered here this weekend, I brought whatever musicality I do possess uh, to the monumental topic of fracking in the hopes that if I can't, if uh, perhaps I can make my words dance together, even if you all stay in your seats. So let me begin in an unlikely place along the Blue Nile River in the Sudan. It was here 25 years ago that I began a study of the interconnections between ecology, warfare, and famine. And uh, I had hoped actually to travel upstream along the Blue Nile into Ethiopia to the headwaters of the Nile um, where a lot of clear cutting of forests were, were going on that was silting up the, the Nile and destroying its uh, ecology in the Sudan and Egypt. Uh, but civil wars in both the Sudan and Ethiopia prevented me from traveling to the places where I wanted to collect data. And so I lived for a while in a refugee camp along the border and interviewed uh, refugees as they fled from these areas um, to find out what was going on um, in the watershed that I wanted to study. One afternoon, um, a farmer uh, uh, was rumored to have arrived the night before who had seen an entire hillside slide into one of the tributaries of the Blue Nile after the Ethiopian army had done a lot of road building in the area uh, and, and clear cutting of forests and tanks were now moving through that area. Um, and so flood control, natural flood control was lost and this huge um, monsoon rain had sent this whole hillside into the, into the Nile. Uh, and so he, that was exactly the kind of information I was interested in gathering and so um, I sought him out for an interview. And he agreed uh, to talk to me but only on one condition and that is that um, he could also interview me. And so when I got done asking him to tell me the story about what had happened to his river, and he did, he did confirm that, a rumor about what happened to the hillside, then he said, now um, tell me about your American rivers. And so I did. I, my father built the house that I grew up on on the east bluff of the Illinois River. And for those of you who don't know Illinois, it's the second of the three I states that you drive through between New York and California, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa. Illinois is a long arrowhead shaped state and the Illinois River slashes diagonally through that state. Its headwaters is up near Chicago and it joins um, the Mississippi River down in Alton by St. Louis. And so my earliest memory actually is flying around on my tricycle on the um, patio that my father had just poured, my father being a bricklayer. Uh, and I could look down into the Illinois River Valley and see all of the tugboats pushing their, the barges of corn and coal and chemicals up and down 
that river. So I described that scene to my friend and went on asking him to tell me about what had happened to the fish in the tributary of the Nile where his village was located. And he explained to me that after the Nile had silted up, that tributary of the Nile had silted up, all the fish died. And three villages then were uh, without food and had fled as environmental refugees and into this war zone in the middle of Sudan. And, and he didn't know what had happened to everyone else. He was the only one that had safely arrived in this camp. So then he asked um, a, a parallel question. Tell me about um, the fish in your river. How do they taste to you? And that was a question I couldn't answer because in all the years I lived next to the Illinois, uh, and I was born in 1959, there were always fish advisories warning children and women of reproductive age against eating the fish from those river. We have two coal burning power plants and 30 other different industries including one of the world's largest ethanol distilleries, which releases a fair amount of benzene um, in, in, along that river. Um, all of the fish are full of mercury. They're also full of pesticides that we uh, use in the corn and soybean uh, fields that surround uh, on, on, the, on the other side of the factories. Um, and so the river is basically a dead river. Um, and so I'd never eaten a fish from that river. So all that was translated and described, and uh, he then asked me a question I couldn't answer. He asked, so why are you here in Africa? And went on to say, you know, we in this camp are going to organize and go back to Ethiopia and take um, over our land again and drive away those who have poisoned our river. Why have you abandoned your river to come all the way over here and worry about my river? You must go home immediately and take up arms against the men who are poisoning your river. Well, in the belief that uh, the pen is mightier than the sword, I, I, I did, uh, and he actually made me promise I would do that, uh, I did go back uh, and investigate what had happened to my river. Um, and it was not without a sense of irony. I think that's what English professors would call it. Um, in that the reason I had actually come to uh, Sudan and Ethiopia at this point in my life, I was 25 years old, was because I had just finished five years of cancer treatment and was finally uh, free enough, as it were, from the medical system that I could uh, do things like accept a fellowship and travel abroad. Um, and the kind of cancer I was diagnosed with was bladder cancer, which my diagnosing physician had let me know was considered a quintessential environmental cancer. And he had actually asked me a lot of questions about my possible environmental exposures. So to finally be untethered from, this, from the you know, IV drip and the cystoscopic checkups, enough to go to a place to look at the relationship between human health and the environment, only to be told by the first person I really met to go home and take up these same questions in my own backyard was a kind of epiphany for me. Uh, and so uh, eventually I did. I finished my PhD in biology and I uh, worked at the lab bench for a while and was a you know, bona fide college professor. And then with the help of a postdoctoral fellowship from Harvard, uh, spent a year in the Harvard Medical Library studying the relationship between uh, environmental exposures and cancer, and then went back home, moved into my sister's basement, and began to investigate what had happened to that river of mine uh, and what happened to the groundwater, which, as it turns out, was contaminated with dry cleaning fluid, uh, which is linked to bladder cancer. And it turns out I'm not just alone in my story. I was one, my cancer diagnosis is one data point in a cluster of cancers in this community. So that all became the topic of uh, my book, Living Downstream, which was most recently updated and rewritten uh, for a second edition when it came out as a film uh, last year. Uh, and no one, uh, even now, can explain how the dry cleaning fluid got inside those uh, groundwater aquifers. The underlying geology should not have allowed that. Um, but there they are. And so for me, the lesson of living downstream was the realization that the subterranean world that we walk over every day that contains these stony vaults full of our groundwater, is not, it's not just an inert lump of rock down there. It's a really complicated landscape. And it turns out that in my hometown, unbeknownst to everyone who lives there, the, underneath the, some of the surface stone are old sand dunes from an ancient river that used to run uh, underground, but the last ice age kind of bulldozed it over. And so it was probably the presence of all that sand that allowed a solvent um, like perchloroethylene, this dry cleaning solvent, to find its way um, into the water. But until the water was contaminated, we didn't understand any of that. 
So uh, since uh, Living Downstream was um, released, I uh, have had a chance to go with it to a lot of different places. Um, most recently this year, I was in the European Parliament talking about cancer in the environment. Um, I did two congressional briefings over the last year. I was in the White House. I testified before the President's Cancer Panel. And all of this comes out of my belief that there, good science should really inform public policy about the environment and about our health and the relationship between them. Um, and, and, and that should inform everything in terms of it, including how we turn on the lights and what our energy policy should be and how we clean our clothes, right? Maybe we could do, we could clean our suits in some other way that doesn't require a carcinogen. Um, it turns out that green engineers have figured out a way to do it in a non-toxic way, and now we need economists to help us figure out how to take green cleaning and make it the way we do things so we can get perchlorine, uh, perchloroethylene um, completely out of our communities. The technology is there, but we haven't yet subsidized the transformation. So I'm really interested in using science to make the case for a, a green economy. But nevertheless, my favorite thing to do is, is actually what I'm doing right now, which is to come into people's communities to talk with them about environmental risks that are important to them um, and bring science out of the sort of sound-proofed medical literature and, and before the public in you know, a church basement on a Friday night somewhere. So uh, as a biologist who works in the public interest, um, I like, and as an author who writes about these things, I, I, um, I see all biological systems kind of as action movies. I, I like to describe using very visual language what biological systems are like, and, you know, whether it's the kind of the, the fetal testicle that descends into the scrotal sac during pregnancy um, by repelling down the gubernacular lesion, the gubernacular ligament. Um, or whether it's the way the weed killer atrazine poisons the electron transport system within the chloroplasts, which are the little Quonset huts that sit on the, the surface of, the, of a leaf of a plant. Um, atrazine causes a chloroplast to blow up from oxidative stress and so extinguishes the miraculous fact of photosynthesis. Whatever system I'm talking about, I really like taking my readers and my audiences inside the landscape to actually show them what, what it looks like in there. And that is incredibly tough with fracking. Uh, in fact, I, don't, I, don't, I can't think of a single other environmental issue that I talk to audiences about that's as hard to describe as fracking because it takes place inside a subterranean world that's entirely invisible to us. It's a mile below our feet. That's where the Marcellus Shale lies. It's the basement of uh, upstate New York, but nobody's ever been down there, right? There's no Hubble telescope for the Marcellus Shale. So the challenge is to make people feel invested in the integrity of a landscape that, that nobody has ever seen. 